Heavenly Father, we ask that you would allow your Holy Spirit and angels to attend this meeting and that what we share here would be easy to understand, edifying, and for your glory and honor. And as we put these subjects in place to bring to a conclusion um, our consideration of the 1843 chart, we ask that you would bless our efforts to make it clear and simple. In Jesus' name, amen. As I've said maybe a couple times before in trying to give an overview of this study, um, when we get to the conclusion of this study, we're going to try to demonstrate why the 1843 chart has a present truth application here at the end of the world. And in about a month ago in Boise, in the Boise, Idaho area anyway, um, we did a presentation where we spent much of the time focusing on the different places in inspiration where inspiration teaches that the history of the Millerite time period is repeated to the very letter, and there are several. Um, you can show this from the parable of the ten virgins. You can show it from the seven thunders of Revelation 10, verse 4. You can show it in Revelation 10, where verse 1 begins in 1840, and verse 11 ends on October 22, 1844, and verse 11 says uh, that these things are going to be repeated. You can show it from the three angels' messages, where Sister White identifies the details of the three angels' messages and shows that they will be repeated in the fourth angel's message. You can show it um, from the cleansing that is associated with the second and fourth angels' message, which Sister White um, teaches was prefigured by the two times when Christ cleansed the temple. So there, there are several places in inspiration where you can demonstrate that that history of 1840 to 1844 is fulfilled. And, and to the very letter is a phrase that Sister White uses about that history. It's repeated again. Once you put that in place, which we think we did a, um, a fairly thorough job in Boise a month or so ago, then you have a, um, a foundation in place to deal with the 1843 chart because there's no way that you can go back and look closely at the pioneer time period of 1840 to 44 and not recognize that this chart was one of the components of the experience of that history of that time period. And in, in connection with this chart, two passages in scripture, which we've already put in the record of these presentations, Habakkuk 2 and Ezekiel 12, are directly connected to the production and understanding the production of this chart and the understanding of what was taking place in that time period. So this presentation is basically a follow-up to the presentation in Boise where the repeat of history gives you the, the argument that there must be some kind of light that shines from this chart here at the end of the world. Not, and, I, and there's no way that I understand, and I do not believe, I would oppose the idea that this chart is somehow uh, used at the end of the world in, in evangelism to non-Seventh-day Adventists as it was by the Millerites. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting that whether you've noticed it or not, partially part of the way through, we've already um, dealt more than once with the prophetic history associated with the ten horns of pagan Rome, the ten kingdoms, and three are removed. This is on this chart. We've been dealing with the 2520 on this chart that virtually... Very few of us in Adventism even knew was there. Um, we've been dealing with 1844, of course, 508. We've been dealing with the subject of Rome, which is illustrated throughout this chart. And before we conclude, we'll deal with the subject of the seven trumpets, which are illustrated and um, identified here on this chart. Specifically, we'll be dealing with the first and second woe as evidence and uh, identification of the third woe. The... We're going to make a case that everything on this chart has a connection with the end of the world. And uh, so that's where we're going with all this. And as I've been considering the Boise meetings, which no doubt no one here, well, I take that back. There are four of us in this room that were at the Boise meetings. Um, but no, very few of the people watching this or in this room have heard those. And there were 13 presentations. And the first six dealt with this repetition of history. And then the the last seven dealt with what we've been dealing with here in the beginning, Rome in prophecy. And so when I put this material together, 
I, I understood for myself that the first five or six presentation, as this one will be, is repetition of what we've been sharing for years. People that have been listening to our material through the newsletters and tapes or at meetings, they've often heard us deal with the relationship between pagan and papal Rome and Daniel and Revelation. And I was thinking to myself, this is the this is the boring part, this is the redundant part. But this afternoon I was thinking that it may very well be that the Lord intended us to go to Boise and put the first half on the repetition of history together, and then the last half was this information about Roman prophecy, and then start this presentation, the first part with the Roman pro prophecy, because that is the burden of this, this whole series here, is that we have a responsibility to write the vision and make it plain, and this vision at the end of the world is made plain by understanding Rome and Bible prophecy, because Rome is what establishes the vision. It's just the, under, the correct understanding of Rome that allows us to to recognize what the United States is doing today. It's the correct understanding of Rome that allows us to recognize it's the role of the papacy today. It's the correct understanding of Roman prophecy that allows us to understand what the United Nations is doing today. It's the correct understanding of Rome that allows us to understand what radical Islam is doing in the world today. So if, if this 1843 chart is going to have a connection with end time Bible prophecy, and I believe it does, then maybe I don't need to be so apologetic about the repetition that we're doing about Rome in prophecy, which um, we're coming to our conclusion of that study with number six. The title of this is Foundational Logic, Rome in the Book of Daniel. And on page 45, if you're following along in the syllabus, you have Daniel 2, and we've pulled the verses out of Daniel 2 that deal with Rome. And then we summarize, not all, I'm not, uh, as we go through Daniel and uh, identify Rome in different passages of Daniel, I'm not suggesting that every detail, every characteristic of Rome is in, my, in the summaries I'm setting forth. But the ones that seem important to me, and, and there's no way I could understand everything, we, or what we're summarizing here. In, in Daniel chapter 2, Rome is the Iron Kingdom. Unlike the pioneers of Adventism, in Daniel chapter 2, the two legs of this um, statue here, this is pagan and papal Rome. The pioneers, as you can see here, identified this as pagan Rome. And what needs to be factored into all of this is the pioneers believed everything was coming to a conclusion by 1843. So as they addressed the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, they sought to find a conclusion for those prophecies that took place before 1843 or at 1843, and therefore the logic of their understanding about 1843 and then 1844 shortly thereafter forced them to seek for identifications of prophecy that made them err in some places. But still, if you go back and see the reasoning, even on the, the positions that they were off, I mean, you go back and look at um, what William Miller has to say about Revelation 13, and he was incorrect. He was incorrect. Uh, but as you look at his logic for his incorrect position on Revelation 13, it's still some pretty strong logic. He wasn't, he wasn't just pulling things out of the air. He was reasoning the way you're supposed to reason when you address the Bible, and it's easy for me to see why they were forced into identifying Daniel 2 the way that they did, but it isn't correct. Um, in in the Bible, and also Sister White confirms, that in the Bible, iron represents churchcraft, clay represents, or iron represents statecraft, clay represents churchcraft. And so when we get down to the end of the, the statue of Daniel 2 and we see the mixture of iron and clay, it's identifying a theme that runs from the beginning of Bible prophecy all the way to the end. The first place you see the theme of church and state introduced in the Bible is um, in, in the description of where Lucifer wanted to ascend and he wanted to set up on the, th the throne of God. He wanted to exalt his throne above God's throne and he also wanted to set in the sides of the north. Sides of the north um, is God's church, the throne, God's political authority. From the very beginning, Satan wanted to take control of the, the civil authority of the Lord and the religious authority of the Lord in, in Genesis 10 and 11 in the story of Babel, which is the beginning of the story of Babylon that concludes here at the end of the world with 
the United States, the United Nations, and the papacy. We see that Nimrod built a city, a city very easy to show in Bible prophecy, represents a geopolitical kingdom, civil. The city represents the civil structure that Nimrod built, and he also built a, temp, uh, a tower, and in Desire of Ages, Sister White is clear that a tower represents a church. So in the very beginning of the story of Babylon in Genesis 10 and 11, one of the themes of Babylon is the combination of church and state. It runs all the way through Bible prophecy in a variety of ways. So when we get to Daniel 2, we see the iron and clay, and then we have a statement, as you'll see in your notes, if you look there on page 45, where Sister White plainly says the iron and the clay represents the combination the state, statecraft and churchcraft at the end of the world. This is not only consistent with the symbol of clay and iron in the Bible, it is also consistent with the theme that runs through Bible prophecy, dealing with the combination of church and state. The ten toes are ten kings in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, there are ten kings that occur in several passages of Scripture that are identifying the civil authority at the end of the world. Those ten kings are the ten toes of Daniel 2. In Revelation 17, you have ten kings that receive one kingdom. That's what it says in Revelation 17. Some people in Adventism in the Protestant world say the ten kings in Revelation 17 represent the ten nations of pagan Rome uh, when Daniel 7 disintegrates into ten kingdoms. Um, it can't be that because those ten kingdoms of Daniel 7, each of those kings had their own kingdom. Three of those kingdoms are going to be removed. In Revelation 17, the ten horns, it says, have received no kingdom in the singular. They receive one kingdom. Uh, in Psalm 83, you find um, an introduction to an evil confederacy at the end of the world. And the, in the first four verses, five verses, it tells that the purpose of this confederacy is to persecute God's people and remove Israel from being a people any longer on planet Earth. And you'll notice that in Revelation 17, verse, verse 14, that the ten kings are going to make war against Christ. The ten kings in Revelation 17 make war against Christ by persecuting his people. And in Psalm 83, there's a confederacy that wants to, to destroy Israel from any longer being a people. And then in verse 6 through 8, I believe it is, if you count very carefully the nations that make up this confederacy in Psalm 83, there are ten of them. Psalm 83 says that this confederacy is of one heart. Revelation 17 says the ten kings are of one mind. Uh, there's there's, there's a, a principle that you can show from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Easiest scripture to see is 1 Corinthians 10, 11, where it says, now all these things happen as an example of the end of the world. Um, that's paraphrased, but that's what it is. This, the Bible is illustrating the end of the world, so when we see ten, a tenfold confederacy, in Psalm 83, describing a confederacy that's going to attempt to persecute God's people, that's obviously the psalmist illustration of the ten kings of Revelation 17. And upon the testimony of two things established, but we have the testimony of three here. Daniel 2, these ten kings. It's in the days of these kings, Daniel says in Daniel 2. It's in the days of these kings when the God of heaven is going to set up his kingdom can't be, as the pioneers understood, the ten nations of pagan Rome, because there's, there's no legitimate argument to be raised that God set up his kingdom in the days um, from, the, say, the 4th century, 5th century, until the 6th century. There's just no argument. There's no testimony that you can bring that God set up his kingdom during that time period. Now, on October 22nd, 1844... Christ entered into the most holy place to do what? To receive a kingdom. But if you, if you study that out very closely, it's not till the end of the investigative judgment when he actually gets the complete control of that kingdom. So if you're going to identify when Christ sets up his kingdom, you may be able to make a case October 22nd, 1844. You can make a better case at the end of the world, the second coming of Christ. But in neither one of those two arguments can you place the ten kings of Daniel 7 in that time period? And Daniel 2 says, In the days of these kings, of these ten toes, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Just Daniel 2 prevents you from identifying the ten toes as the ten nations of pagan Rome. 
And, uh, but the pioneers were forced to think that everything come to a conclusion by 1843, um, so they did so. So I'd suggest to you that the ten toes in agreement with, with the story of the three Elijahs, which we will deal with later, that uh, in, there are three illustrations of Elijah, Elijah the first, Elijah the second, who was John the Baptist, and God's people at the end of the world. Keep this real simple for some of the, you that may have not followed this study through before. Elijah the first represents God's people at the end of the world that do not die. John the Baptist, Elijah the second represents God's people at the end of the world that are laid to rest. Elijah never died. John the Baptist lost his head. Both Elijahs, Elijah the first, Elijah the second, had to, were confronted with a threefold enemy. In the story of Elijah the first, you had Ahab, Jezebel, and the prophets of Baal. Ahab was a king. Bible prophecy, a king is a kingdom of civil power. Jezebel was an impure woman that had come into an, in, an unlawful relationship with Ahab, the combination of church and state. An impure woman's an impure church. Jezebel representing Catholicism at the end of the world. Ahab representing the civil power that comes into a church-state relationship with Ahab at the end of the world. And you have a third power that does a dance of deception. The prophets of Baal danced all day long to deceive the people. And we know at the end of the world, the power that deceives is the United States, the false prophet, that in verse 14 and 15 of Revelation 13, verses 13, 14, and 15 of Revelation 13 goes out to deceive the world by calling fire down out of heaven inside of men. And where, where does John get that illustration of the United States calling fire down out of heaven inside of men? It comes from the story of Elijah. John using that description to identify the deceiving work of the United States at the end of the world is telling the student of prophecy, if you're going to understand the role of the United States in deceiving the world, then you need to go to the story of Elijah. And in the story of Elijah, there were three powers. A power that did the work of deception, did the dance of deception, an impure woman, an impure church, a civil power. And in Elijah II, John the Baptist, he had to deal with a threefold power, Herod, civil power, king, kingdom, Herodias, a woman that he was not supposed to be married to, an impure woman, his brother's wife, same relationship as Jezebel and Ahab. And the daughter of Herodias, and the, the Protestant sects are the daughter of Rome, the daughter of Herodias was named Salome, and she did the dance of deception. And the first Elijah, the United States, is symbolized by the prophets of Baal that did the dance of deception. And the second Elijah, the John the Baptist, the United States, is represented by Salome that does the dance of deception. The United States is the false prophet, is the power that deceives the world at the end to accept the image of, and mark of the beast. The Roman church in the first Elijah is Jezebel. The Roman church in the second Elijah, John the Baptist, is Herodias. Both of those women were behind the scenes in the story, pulling the strings, and both were married to kings they weren't supposed to be married to. But when it comes to the ten toes of Daniel 2, and the ten kings of Revelation 17, and the ten nations of Psalm 83, Ahab represents the civil power at the end of the world that comes into a church-state relationship with Jezebel, and Ahab was the king of the northern kingdom of Israel, and how many tribes made up the northern kingdom? Ten tribes. No accidents in God's word. The number ten represents the civil power at the end of the world. And uh, as you go very carefully down through this, if, if, we're, if we're treating this as the statue of Daniel 2, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome, then you come to the iron and clay. What is the kingdom that follows pagan and papal Rome that one of the characteristics of its prophetic role is the combination of church and state? The United States of America, and that's in the iron and clay in the feet. And then when you get down to the toes, you're getting down to the, the final kingdom, the ten horns of Revelation 17. Um, that's the... Uh, the, the logic of Daniel 2. And you see in, in your notes, Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 4, 1168, we have now come to a time when God's sacred work is represented by the feet of the image in which the iron was mixed with miry clay. Now, when Sister White wrote, the, wrote this, she's saying we've come to the time where the, the clay and iron are mixed together. We're down to the feet of the image. And when was she living? She was living in the time period of the United States. This is where the, 
the combination of church and state takes place. She says, but statesmen will uphold the spurious stab, Sabbath and will mingle their religious faith with the observance of this child of the papacy, placing it above the Sabbath with which the Lord has sanctified and blessed, setting it apart for man to keep holy as a sign between him and his people to thousands of thousand generations. The mingling of churchcraft and statecraft is represented by iron and the clay. Um, so we're on solid ground when we're relating to Daniel 2 in the way that we just did, because you can certainly make this statement by Sister White square with what we've just said, but you can't make Sister White's statement square with the pioneer position that was teaching that these toes took place prior to the papacy um, in the disintegration of pagan Rome. Um, there's another argument. It's, it's more subtle, but it's just as valid is that everywhere that Rome is illustrated in the book of Daniel, its two phases are illustrated. Daniel 7, both phases. Daniel 8, both phases. Daniel 11, both phases of Rome are illustrated. And so if you go in reverse order in your rule of repeat and enlarge, it is totally acceptable to expect that Daniel 2, where it's all set forth, illustrates both phases of Rome, and that's the legs. And if you read what Uriah Smith says about it, because he rejects what I'm saying here because he upholds the pioneer position, uh, when you read what he says about this only po could only possibly be pagan Rome, notice his argument and then ask, ask yourself if you apply his argument to the two shoulders, if it works. Because the two shoulders, who, what do we use the two shoulders to emphasize? Two shoulders, the Medes, the Persians. The fact that there's two shoulders is something that we use to e e emphasize a two-fold kingdom. And if we can use the two shoulders to represent the Medes and the Persians, it's totally acceptable to use two legs to represent pagan and papal Rome. Um, some prophecies God has repeated, thus showing that, that importance must be given to them. The Lord does not repeat things that are of no great consequence. So Daniel 7, you'll see the verses in Daniel 7 um, where you can pull out the subject of Rome. And in verses 23 to 25 of Daniel 7, you'll, know that, you'll notice that pagan Rome, this fourth kingdom of Bible prophecy, it's identified, identified as being diverse, or in modern terminology, different than the kingdoms that were before it. And then as the papacy comes into the narrative and it's identified, it's also identified as diverse or different. So in Daniel 7, you have both phases of Rome, pagan Rome and papal Rome, under the category of the diverse king. In Daniel 2, you have both phases of Rome under the category of the legs. In Daniel 7, you have both phases of Rome under the category of the little horn. In Daniel 11, both phases of Rome under the category of the king of the north. Not an accident. Let's, let's uh, look at verses 23 to 25. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall, come, shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down or break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. So both Pagan Rome and Papal Rome in Daniel 7 are put in the category of the, of the diverse or different king. Um, we're going to deal a little bit with Daniel 8 a little further on, but the pioneer understanding, which is correct, um, Daniel 8, 9, it says, And out of one, one of them came forth a little horn. Pioneers specifically and purposely say that this little horn represents both phases of Rome, and it does. So Daniel 2, it's two legs. Daniel 7, two diverse kingdoms. Daniel 8, two little horns. Daniel 11, um, the rule of, of who the king of the south and king of the north are in Daniel 11 is established in Daniel 11 because the struggle between the king of the south and the king of the north is only portrayed in Daniel 11. You find it nowhere else in the Bible. And the rule for who the king of the south is in Daniel 11 is the power that at any point in time controls Egypt is the king of the south, and the power that controls Syria or Babylon is the king of the north. That's the internal rule that has been placed in Daniel 11 that the pioneers recognized and identified. 
And in verses 16 and 17, the three areas of conquest for pagan Rome are set forth as Syria, which was Babylon, what we would call Babylon, Babylon, Israel, and Egypt. And in verse 16, when pagan Rome conquered Syria or Babylon, at that point in history, among other things, it became the king of the north of Daniel 11. And then in verses 27 through 30, at the very end of the time period of pagan Rome, um, you see in verse 30, pagan Rome having intelligence with papal Rome. And at this point, the papacy takes ascendancy over pagan Rome, and you can argue that it's here that they became the king of the north. I, I can also make the argument that it took place early, earlier in history, in the year 330, um, because at that point in history, I don't necessarily need to cloud the issue here, but after the time period of the cross, we're looking for a spiritual application. Before the time period of the cross, we're looking for a literal application. So after the time period of the cross, we're looking for the power that controls spiritual Babylon. And Babylon in history, the dragon power, begins on the plains of Shinar with Nimrod. And at the fall of the Tower of Babel, the, the religious leaders of Babylon, the Chaldeans, their, their base of operation was the country of Babylon, the city of Babylon in Babylon. And when Babylon fell, where did they move to? Where did the Chaldeans, the historians tell us, where did the Chaldeans, the leaders of the religion of Babylon, move to? Pergamos, because in Pergamos, in the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3, one of the characteristics of Pergamos is it says it's where Satan's seat is. And the, the seat of the Babylonian religion begins in the Tower of Babel, Babylon, then it goes to Pergamos. And when pagan Rome conquered Pergamos, it took the religious elite and the, the idols of, of the religion of Pergamos and it brought it back to the city of Rome, placing it in the Pantheon Temple. So the religion of Babylon moved from Babylon to Pergamos to the city of Rome. So that's where spiritual Babylon was located. And in the year 330, when pagan Rome moved to Constantinople, leaving the papacy alone in the city of Rome, in theory, you can argue at that point, the papacy controlled spiritual Babylon. And therefore, at that point, it's the king of the north, um, which, which there's a lot of logic to that because the first conquering of pagan Rome is Syria. It becomes the, pagan, the king of the north, and it continues to do so until the time prophecy associated with, associated with pagan Rome is finished. But nevertheless, whether you choose verses 27 through 29 in Daniel 11 or the year 330, in Daniel 11 there comes a point in time where the papacy prevails over pagan Rome, and it becomes the king of the north. Um, in terms of Daniel 2, um, on page 47, you will see um, two quotes d dealing with the fact that Christ is the one that is going to rule the world with a rod of iron. Iron is a symbol of statecraft. And uh, you see in Heavenly Places, page 28, concerning the clay, Sister White says, In his word, God compares himself to a potter and his people to the clay. His work is to mold and fashion them after his own similitude. The lesson they are to learn is the lesson of submission. Self is, to not, self is not to be made prominent. If due attention is given to divine instruction, if self is surrendered to the divine will, the hand of the potter will produce a shapely vessel. Clay represents churchcraft, our relationship to Christ. Iron, statecraft. So you see the ten toes of Revelation 17 there. Um, Ahab, we've mentioned. Uh, another place where ten is symbolic of these ten kings, you see in Ezekiel 30. This is a judgment against Egypt. Egypt, more often than not, in Bible prophecy, represents the entire world. And in Ezekiel 29 and 30, where there is a prophecy identifying the judgment against Egypt, the judgment against the world at the end of time, as it begins to unfold how Egypt is punished, it identifies ten cities in Egypt that are punished. That's the ten toes of Daniel 2, the ten kings of Revelation 17, the ten tribes of Psalm 83, the ten nations of Ahab. Um, you have Psalm 83 there. Um, you have a quote from the Great Controversy that identifies when Christ um, is setting up his kingdom. Uh, we can read it. <laughs> 
This is on page 48, Great Controversy 479. And behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, Daniel 7, 13, and 14. The coming of Christ here described is not his second coming to earth. He comes to the Ancient of Days in heaven to receive dominion and glory and a kingdom which will be given to him at the, close of, at the close of his work as a mediator. So he receives the kingdom in the investigative judgment, but actually takes reception of it when Michael stands up and human probation closes. Review and Herald, January 25th, 1906. To the church of today, God has given the care of his vineyard. The workers of today are called to do the work that Israel failed of doing. The salvation of God must be made known to all people living on the face of the earth. God's glory is to be revealed, his word established, and Christ's kingdom set up to give deliverance to the world. His followers are now to arise and shine. The setting up of Christ's kingdom is taking place during the time period that we call the investigative judgment, which began on October 22, 1844. Technically, it's not established until human probation closes. There's no way that when Daniel 2 says, in the days of these kings, these ten toes, the God of heaven sets up a kingdom. It just can't be the ten nations of pagan Rome. There were hundreds of years before God was setting up his kingdom. So if you, if you summarize in the next page, Roman prophecy, Daniel 7, on page 49, if you take the passages out of Daniel 7 that are dealing with Rome and you... And you use my summary. I'm missing some things, no doubt, and I may be stating things a little bit incorrectly. This Rome in Daniel 7 is the diverse kingdom. It's the fourth kingdom. The fourth kingdom has two phases. The, both phases are desolating powers. This is one of the characteristics of Rome that prophecy is very specific to identify. Both phases persecute God's people. Um, First part of the, the kingdom disintegrates into ten kingdoms. Three kingdoms removed for the horn with eyes. The second phase is the little horn with eyes. The horn with eyes is the fifth kingdom. And the horn with eyes concludes prior to the judgment. If, if you haven't ever noticed that in Daniel 7, you, you need to read Daniel 7 a few times. This is an established, very easy fact to see, but this is important to see, is that when it comes to Daniel 7... It, it is specific that papal Rome in Daniel 7 receives its deadly wound before the judgment begins. And it's there right there in Daniel 7. And we, we should know that as Seventh-day Adventists. Most of us do. The horn with eyes concludes prior to the judgment. And the horn with eyes rules for 1,260 years. That's the logic of Rome, the, the story of Rome in Daniel 7. In Rome in prophecy in Daniel 8, page 50. Um, one of the trickiest passages, and you'll see um, Daniel 8, 8 through 12 is dealing with Rome, and of course 23 through 25, and there's no way that you, you can't, that you don't include verses 13 and 14, and we do have them on here as well, but if you bring the characteristics out on these verses, under verse 8 and 9, these are the characteristics. The little horn of verse 9, follows the kingdom of Greece. The little horn represents pagan and papal Rome. As, as Verse 9, 10, 11, and 12, if you look very carefully at those four verses, the subject of all four of those verses is the little horn. Uh, but in each verse, who the little horn is changes. In the first verse, the little horn is pagan Rome. That's verse 9. In verse 10, it's papal Rome. In verse 11, it's pagan Rome. In verse 12, it's papal Rome. And, and there are ways um, to identify that. They need to be identified because they're, well, just for the obvious confusion that it's brought into Adventism today, that here at the end of the world, the modern theologians are teaching the opposite thing about verse 11 than the pioneers taught, tells you this is something we need to wrap our mind about around. If there's a discussion, a disagreement going on among us in our house, then as students of prophecy, we need to come to grips with which side the truth falls on. And the little horn is being addressed in verse 9, 10, 11, and 12. And uh, the little horn's actions, in, in, by actions in verse 9, there are specific actions in verse 9 of 
Daniel 8, that the little horn does. What are the actions? It conquers um, the east, Syria. It conquers the pleasant land, Israel. And it conquers the south, Egypt. That's the action of the little horn. And as the verbs, the verbs describe actions. As the verbs describe the actions of the little horn in verse 9, they're placed in the masculine tense. It conquers, the little horn, verse 9, conquers Syria, Israel, Egypt. When Egypt is conquered in 31 BC, pagan Rome rules the world supremely for 360 years in fulfillment of Daniel 11, verse 24. And notice this last point, verse point six on page 50. Verse 9, when it's speaking about pagan Rome, about its actions against Syria and Israel and Egypt, in this verse, there's four verses here of the, that are telling the story of the little horn. Two of the verses talk about pagan Rome. Two of the verses talk about papal Rome. So when you take the two verses that talk about pagan Rome, you find that one of the verse is describing the actions of pagan Rome on an earthly level, and the other verse is describing the actions of pagan Rome on a heavenly level. And then when you look at the two verses dealing with papal Rome, you'll see that one of the verses is describing papal Rome's action on an earthly level, and the other verse describes the, Rome, the movement's actions of papal Rome on a heavenly level. That's not an accident, but in verse 9, when pagan Rome is conquering Egypt, Israel, and Syria, that's the, the earthly level of the warfare that pagan Rome carries out. In verse 10, the little horn is in the feminine. And what's a woman in Bible prophecy? A church, a woman. This is papal Rome. Uh, it's identifying papal Rome, and it, in, in verse 10, papal Rome is trampling down God's people, which agrees with Revelation 11, verses 2 and 3. And verse 10 is emphasizing the warfare of papal Rome against heaven. It's, a, it's at the, on the heavenly plane when it deals with the papacy. Now in verse 11, it go, the little horn goes back to masculine, once again identifying pagan Rome. Um, and it says that pagan Rome magnifies itself against Christ. It did so at his birth by trying to kill him. It did so at the cross when it did put him to death. Pagan Rome lifts up and exalts the religion of paganism. This is also an attack against heaven. This is lifting up the, the counterfeit religion and, and smearing it in the face of heaven. And uh, it casts down the city of Rome as its capital in the year, year 330. But essentially, verse 11 is telling the history of pagan Rome in its warfare against heaven, where verse 9 was dealing with its warfare on earth. And then in verse 12, the little horn goes back to feminine papal Rome, and it describes how the papacy uh, received the, the military support from the seven European kings through the combination of church and state in order to remove the Hiroli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. And this is telling how the papacy on an earthly level gets established on the throne of the earth. So it's not an accident out of the four verses both the earthly and heavenly warfare of both of these powers, pagan Rome and papal Rome, is addressed in each of the individual verses. Then in verse 13, a question is raised, and it's a question of duration. How long shall be the complete vision about paganism and papalism and what they will do in this vision? And not only is how long, but it tells us what they will do. They're going to trample down the sanctuary and God's people during that time period. And then in verse 14, we have the answer that in 1844, the sanctuary will be cleansed. And in uh, verses 23 to 25, at the end of Daniel 8, you have the identification, primarily the whole identification. Um, when Gabriel's given his definition of who these powers are represented by these horn powers, um, verses 23 to 25 is identifying characteristics of pagan Rome till you get down to the very last phrase of verse 25, which is identifying the papacy. Daniel always portrays Rome in two phases. In Daniel 9, Roman prophecy, we went through this this morning, um, verses 26 and 27. In verse 26 of Daniel 9, in the midst of Gabriel explaining the, the part of the 23 hundred year prophecy where Christ was doing his work and uh, sacrificing himself. Um, in that 
part of the history. It says in verse 26, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. This is pagan Rome. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. And the, the, the flood is representing the papacy during the Dark Ages, according to Revelation 12, verse 15. And unto the end of the world, war, desolations are determined, and the end of the war is 1798. Um, and this, of course, is not widely understood by Adventists, but uh, 1798 is not simply the end of the 1260-year time prophecy of the papacy. It's also the end of the 2520-year time prophecy that began when... Assyria carried the northern kingdom captive. And then in verse 27, it says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even to the consummation. Verse 26 and 27 are to, are to be considered together. Into, under the consummation of what? Under the consummation of the war. He's going to make it desolate until the end of the war, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolator, upon the desolate. There's a punishment in 1798 that will be delivered against the desolating power that we know as the papacy. And in 1798, the papacy received a deadly wound. And, and when you summarize these verses down on top of page 52, uh, verse 26, pagan Rome destroys the city and the sanctuary in AD 70. In verse 26, the papacy persecutes the church through a flood from 538 to 1798. Verse 27, at the consummation of God's indignation against his people, the papacy receives a deadly wound in 1798. Rome and prophecy in Daniel 11. And this summarization of Rome and prophecy in Daniel 11 is very minimal. There is much more, even though it's, it seems like a lot if you're looking at it here at the end of the day. Uh, there's much more that could be said. But pagan Rome first comes into... The narrative in verse 14, it's identified as the robbers of thy people. Um, in verse 14, it's also identified that it's Rome that establishes the vision. And then in verse 16 through 30, pagan Rome is the subject of the prophecy. Verse 20, 20 is the call of Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem. Now, if you go through Daniel 11, you'll see that, that some of the, the histories that are identified in these verses are the most significant histories of the 6,000 years of existence of planet Earth in terms of the story of salvation. Uh, the point being, we have here the, the verse that tells when Joseph and Mary are going to go to Bethlehem. We have uh, the crucifixion of Christ in these verses. We have the story of Anthony and Cleopatra. And among other things, these histories are in here because God wants us to make sure and understand that verses 16 through 30 is talking about pagan Rome. It's taken histories from that time period and he's saying to the student of prophecy, you, you don't want to lose your way on this one. These verses are dealing with the history of pagan Rome. Keep focused. These are, it, this is something we need to understand. That's one of the reasons these well-known histories are in there. Verse 22, pagan Rome crucifies Christ. Verse 24, the time prophecy identifying how long pagan Rome would rule the world. Verse 27, 29, identify the end of that time prophecy with the phrase, the time appointed. And verse 30, Papal Rome takes the ascendancy over pagan Rome. And when pagan Rome has intelligence with the man of sin, from this point on, verse 31 onward, the subject is no longer pagan Rome. It is Papal Rome. Now, the first place you hear Papal Rome is in verse 30. It's the power that has forsaken the holy covenant that pagan Rome has intelligence with. But... Uh, in verse 31, the seven European kings, represented as the arms, they stand up for the papacy, 496 to 508 and onward. In verse 31, pagan Rome, the arms, the seven European kings, they pollute the city of Rome. Uh, either when Constantine cast down Rome in the year 330 and moved to Constantinople, or in the warfare that, warfare that confronted the city of Rome during that history. The pioneers point to both those as fulfillments of pagan Rome, polluting the city of Rome. In verse 31, pagan Rome, the seven European kings, removes paganism as the legal religion of their kingdoms, as they accept the church-state relationship with the papacy from 496 to 508. 
And in verse 31, pagan Rome, the seven European kings, placed the papacy on the throne of the earth in 538. Verse 32 to 35 described the persecution of the Dark Ages, once the papacy took control of the world. Verse 35 identifies the time appointed for the papacy as the time of the end. The time appointed in the book of Daniel is the end of a time prophecy, and in verse um, 35, Daniel is identifying that the time appointed is also called the time of the end. This is important to mark because when you come to verse 40 of Daniel 11 and it says, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push against him, the book of Daniel has established that the time of the end in verse 40 is 1798. Um, so there are reasons to be specific. In fact, you know, there's a quote um, that I have with me and where Sister White's talking about those among us that reapplied the time prophecies at the end of the world in a day-for-a-day -day fashion, and she, she identifies that as fanaticism, just for the record. Um, if, if, you take, if you take the um, 1335 as illustrated on this chart, Sister White says we have no new message. We're to continue to preach the things that brought the people out of the churches in 1843, and this chart is a representation of what brought the people out of the church in 1843, and the 1335 and the 1290 are part of this message, and if you take the 1335 and the 1290 of Daniel 12 and you place them at the end of the world in a day-for-a-day -day fashion, you have destroyed the foundations of Adventism, and there is one passage where she's dealing with men and women that are doing that, and she says the reason that they do it, and this part is almost word for word, is they do not understand where to locate the time of the end. So being clear and specific about the time of the end in the book of Daniel is important, because if you don't understand what the time of the end is, where to place it, what it means, then you're tempted to take time prophecies and place them for a day for a day fashion at the end of the world. And if you look closely at Sister White says, what Sister White says about that, Sister White says the primary reason the Jews crucified Christ is from a misunderstanding of doctrine. Is that what she says? No, it's from a misunderstanding of prophecy. They expected Christ to set up an earthly kingdom when he was coming to set up a spiritual kingdom. From a misunderstanding of prophecy, God's people crucified their Redeemer. And Sister White says Seventh-day Adventists have two opportunities to parallel that action. There's two prophetic misunderstandings that Sister White says parallels the crucifixion of Christ by the Jews. One is believing that we can wait till the Sunday law for the Holy Spirit to be poured out, us, out upon us in the latter rain and finish the work of character development. If we wait for the outpouring of the latter rain to finish the work of character development, then we receive the mark of the beast. That's a prophetic misunderstanding that parallels the crucifixion of Christ by the Jews. The other one that Sister White points to is taking the time prophecies and reapplying them at the end of the world in a day-for-a-day -day fashion. That's how serious it is. Um, to not destroy the foundations of Adventism. So where the time of the end and what the time of the end is is important. And number eight, summarizing Daniel 11, verse 36 and verse 37 describe the self-exalting character of the papacy. Verse 37, verse 38 and 39, and in the notes it says 37 and 8. Please change that for your own in verse 38 and 39, describe the introduction of the worship and exaltation of the so-called Virgin Mary in Catholicism. Verse 40 describes the warfare that began in 1798, represented by the time of the end between Catholicism and atheism. It concludes when the Soviet Union is swept away in 1989. Verse 41 is describing a Sunday law in the United States. Verse 40. 2 and 43, here's another typo, and number 12, it should be verses 42 and 43, are describing when the papacy takes control of the entire world as represented by Egypt in those verses. Verse 44 is identifying the third angel's messing swelling to a loud cry and the persecution that takes place during that time period. And verse 45 describes when the papacy comes to his end and none shall help. At this point, um, we have prepared, I hope, a platform of understanding of Rome in Daniel and Revelation, primarily in Daniel, that's consistent with the pioneer understanding of Rome. And this prepares the way for us to...
go to the next step in our study, but um, we should close with prayer at this point. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we understand from your word that it is Rome that establishes the prophetic vision at the end of time. And we understand that those that are represented by the 144,000 are the restorers of the breach and the restorers of the past to dwell in. And that at this time in earth's history, those people are going to be those that Jeremiah identifies as seeking out the old paths to walk in and the old paths for Adventists at the end of the world are the paths that were established by the pioneers who were used of God to raise up the foundations of Adventism. And here at the end of the world, as the vision of the hour, the message of the hour is being lifted up through your spirit for men to receive and proclaim, we recognize that in order to understand this vision, that we must preserve those foundations and we must relate to this vision um, with the key that Rome establishes it. And we thank you for putting, in us, putting us in a position where we can see um, the role and significance of the subject of Rome. And as we continue on we, with these studies, we ask that you would bring um, the message, the, the Chow's own vision into our understanding, the message of the events that are taking place, and that you would use th these truths to compel us to enter into the most holy place that we can also attain the Mari vision, the vision of the work that you're doing now in removing sin from both the sanctuary and your people, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>